as a transplant surgeon, more often than not, I meet a lot of people who come to me with end organ failure with the last drag of hope that I could save them. Transplantation, of course, is literally a second chance to live. Organ replacements have saved many lives and have transformed many more. If I must say my transition from a general surgeon to a liver transplant surgeon, and much later into a multivisceral transplant surgeon, at least in liver transplantation, by the time I got trained, it was already a well-established procedure worldwide. At least in the last decade, I have seen and been a part of many more things which has made it evolve, made it successful, and trust me, the outcomes are spectacular. I would like to go back in time and uh, narrate a story of a young girl who came into our OPD in our chambers. She was in her early 20s, and uh, she had a visible tummy, but her body outline was totally emaciated. Emaciated means, in medical terms, we call it as uh, malnourishment sarcopenia. So that means she had only skin and bones, and there was hardly any muscle mass left. And physically also, she was very weak. She and her parents came to us with the last ounce of faith, hoping that we could save her. She was diagnosed to have a peculiar tumor called a neuroendocrine tumor. Initially, it started in her stomach, and back then, she did undergo a surgery to remove a part of it. But to her bad luck, the tumor came back and masqueraded its way and plastered itself across the entire abdominal organs. And as a team, we looked into all the images, and uh, we were stuttering in our head for a clear-cut rejection. At this juncture, I would like to say about uh, Dr. Anil Vaidya, where I met him a few years back when I was here, and he was a pioneer in multi-organ transplant surgery. Currently, he is heading the program in Cleveland Clinic in the United States, and there marked the beginning of my journey into the world of multi-organ transplant or multivisceral transplantation. So what do you mean by multi-organ transplant is we replace the entire organs in the digestive system, namely liver, small bowel, pancreas, kidney, and even the large bowel. So getting back to the story, so Dr. Anil, uh, he came up and confidently said, uh, oh, let's replace our entire abdominal organs. So we were all surprised. How can you replace uh, you know, the entire abdominal organs? It was that moment where one person in the room comes out with this crazy idea and uh, who initially or usually gets mocked at saying it's such a delusional thinking. But there was this patient who was in the end of her life and willing to take that last risk, hoping that we could save her. Of course, we have heard of dual transplants. Even I've been a part of many dual transplants, say uh, a combined a liver and a kidney, or even a liver and a small bubble transplant. And uh, very rarely, we have performed liver and heart transplant together. But this was far-fetched. Just imagine changing your entire abdominal organs. But even though it seemed improbable, but nevertheless, it was not an uh, impossible task to execute. I would like to share the history of transplantation. In 1954, Dr. Joseph Murray did the first successful kidney transplant. And later, in the 1960s, we saw successful heart, liver, and pancreas transplant. And later, in the 80s, we also saw successful lung and intestine transplant. Please note, when I say the first successful transplant, but actually what I mean in reality is, there have been multiple attempts by various surgeons across the globe. They have failed, improvised, and later there was a point where they could save a life, and that turned out to be a milestone on a timeline. From there on, every transplant has, a set, has proved itself and became a set criterion for a successful story of each and every transplant. And uh, here, we decided to go ahead with the multi-organ transplant, and we were discussing about uh, the foreseeing complications, and even there was a possibility of death on table. 
After a bit of wait, there was an organ alert, and we found a suitable matching young donor for this lady. And by far, it was one of the most complex surgeries I've ever involved as a part of, and the longest one too. You won't believe it lasted for 24 hours, close to 23 and a half to be more precise. And uh, it was a nightmare for everyone. It was more challenging in the sense because it took nearly 14 to 15 hours just to take out that 15 kg tumor out of her abdomen. And surgery was completed successfully. The patient even recuperated from the operation and she was even walking and talking after a few days. Just after a month, she had a severe infection. In medical term, we call that a sepsis. And by day 41, she succumbed to the disease, that is the infection. We were all quite disheartened because after such a brave surgery, and uh, in, uh, we weren't able to save her. So this happened in 2018. We attempted, but we failed. And uh, this happened in 2022. Dr. Anil Vaidya moved back to Cleveland Clinic and performed the world's first successful complete multi-abdominal or complete multi-organ transplant in the entire abdominal domain, changing about five organs for a very rare tumor in the appendix, and he achieved it. And this is Professor Anil with the team of uh, the patients as well as the team. So where it all started? It started with one eccentric idea which popped in a discussion and led us to this point. This success has a huge say in something called a transplant oncology. So what is transplant oncology? Transplant oncology is a novel treatment to cure cancer with combining various modalities and principles of, say, oncology, transplant medicine, transplant surgery, also immunotherapy. Traditionally, we all know that cancer treatment means there are two pillars. One is surgery, another one is uh, chemo and radiation. Of course, we know that the surgery takes care of the macroscopic tumor that is visible to the naked eye. We perform surgery and take it out. And the chemotherapy and radiation takes care of the microscopic environment. So that means the treatment is successful, right? But why there is recurrence? Some tumor recur in a month's time, some after six months, some after 12 months, some after you know, 24 months. So that means we have left out something. We didn't understand what it is. So basically, nobody went to the root cause of cancer. Cancer is a failure of your immune system. It took very long for us to understand why there was recurrence. And then people started chasing this root cause of cancer. There are specialized cells in our body called the natural killer cells. The natural killer cells, are their only job is to kill any cells which are abnormal or pose a threat to our body. And these natural killer cells, if they are in good shape, that means the chance of you getting a cancer is almost negligible. All this while, we have been aiming at only destroying the cancer cells. And we never thought of restoring the immune power in our body so that it fights effectively against cancer and prevents the recurrence. So this opens up a new horizon of a treatment called cellular therapy. So what do you mean by cellular therapy? Cellular therapy means using normal human organ cells as a drug to fight against disease. For example, when we talk about natural killer cells, we take these natural killer cells culture it in a lab, and modify it before we transfuse into the human body, and make this fight against the cancer cells, and so that we have a complete cure and treatment for cancer. But however, it's only a larger concept, and one size doesn't fit all. 
The cancer cells are smarter than us and is getting even smarter day by day. Every cancer cell is different and they have its own persona. So, for example, a liver cancer is different, a pancreas cancer is different, and a colon cancer is different. And even among themselves, they are very heterogenic. That means they're very diversified. Even uh, the liver cancer can behave in a ten different way. So unless until you have the exact blueprint of the cancer cell, you cannot win the battle. So it's like even in Mahabharata, Ramayana, Greek myth, we always say that to win a battle, you should know the strength of your enemy. And here, the enemy is the cancer cell. Unless until you have the complete schema of the cancer cell, you cannot win the battle. And here, I would like to introduce you to a term called organoids, which is a path-breaking innovation in medical field. Organoids are nothing but a 3D structural reorganization of human tissues which are grown in the lab. For example, if I want to replicate a liver, so this is how an organoid looks like. I take, there are two sources of organoids. So one, we can derive it from the embryonic stem cells, or I can just take a liver tissue or a pancreas tissue and then grow exactly the same in a lab. So how it helps us here is, if a patient has got a liver cancer, so I biopsy or take a small tissue of the liver cancer and replicate the exact same way how it is in the human body in a lab. So by means, I now have the exact schema of a liver cancer or a pancreas cancer or a colon cancer or any cancer of interest. These organoids are not only used in the field of cancer, but this is the future of medical science even every drug or what to study a disease, to understand a disease with this organoids, we'll be able to achieve it. And now, what we do in the lab is, for example, let's talk about a liver cancer. So I have a liver cancer, I take a tissue from the biopsy it, and grow the exact same in the lab. And now, I take these natural killer cells, co-culture with the organoids, and see how efficiently these natural killer cells are attacking it. Sometimes your cancer cell can be more powerful than the natural killer cells. So here I would introduce you to something called a checkpoint inhibitors or a monoclonal antibody. When I introduce this monoclonal antibody and also a checkpoint inhibitors to the natural killer cell, it grows more than 10 arms and now it can fight the cancer cell more efficiently. But for that, we need to know the exact systematic way of how the cancer cell behaves in the body. So here comes the use of artificial intelligence. With the use of artificial intelligence, I can take a cancer cell and I can exactly replicate, however difficult or however uh, complex it may be, I can put it there. And this also helps me choose the natural killer cells, and also a panel of drugs, which is the checkpoint inhibitors and uh, the monoclonal antibodies, I can pick and choose the perfect combination to kill a particular tumor. So that means I'm being super selective here about making a complex cell along with the antibodies, the like monoclonal antibodies, and also this uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and I know how to destroy a particular tumor. So that means I'm not disturbing the other normal cells. So what happens in chemotherapy is, the chemotherapy doesn't know or doesn't differentiate a normal cell and a cancer cell. And that's why you have so many side effects, including your hair fall, your skin peeling off, not able to eat because it destroys the entire cell. But by this, we'll be super selectively attacking only the cancer cell. So as a transplant oncologist, how I see the future of cancer treatment is a recurrence-free cancer treatment. And when your cancer is in stage four, that means it has gone beyond one organ. So usually we turn them down. We say it's like, no, we can't cure it. But with the advent of transplant oncology, macroscopically, we can replace like-for-like -like organs by a multivisceral transplant, which takes care of the surgical part. And by introducing the cellular therapy, I can totally destroy the microenvironment cancer and also by regular infusions, I can always keep a check of how your immunity is restored and how they can prevent recurrence even in the future. 
So this is where I see the future of cancer treatment in the medical field, and this is going to change every life, and we're going to have a totally cancer-free or recurrence-free healthy life.